So please welcome to the stage my friend, Marion Roach Smith. Thank you. What a lovely invitation. How incredibly generous. Thank you, Jeff. I'm a writer who's been at this for a good long time, having started my career at the New York Times right out of college and leaving a perfectly good job at the New York Times to pursue the life that I really wanted. And I hope today that I can inspire you to leave what you're doing that you don't want to do and do what you absolutely do want to do. But I'm not one of those writers who believes in writing prompts, writing exercises, or all the things that are going to fritter away your time. I believe in what's called writing with intent. And I'm going to teach you that system today. I recently set a goal for myself, which was to be on my favorite NPR show. For years, I wrote those quirky essays on All Things Considered. Maybe you've heard some of them. And I then set my goal a little bit higher to tell a story on Kurt Anderson's astonishing Studio 360, which is my favorite show on art and culture on NPR. It's actually on PRI, but that's a distinction. And what you have to do is tell a story about a piece of art that changed your life. And you have to do it without notes. And you have to do it for public radio. And it scared the living daylights out of me. And I thought, OK, here we go. And I told this story about how a little novel by my favorite American writer, William Kennedy, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his Albany series, had written a novel in the 1980s called Legs, which is about a murderous bootlegger. And how that little novel had changed my life, and I had left New York City to go live in upstate New York because I understood that if someone could write like he can in upstate New York, then art is everywhere, and I can live any damn place I want. <laughs> and I left New York, and I lived upstate in the Adirondacks by myself like a crazy woman, and I had the time of my life. And I told this story, and I was pretty excited about this story. And after, when the story was produced and came on NPR, and I was sitting at home listening to it, the topper, the introduction for me, where the great Kurt Anderson talks about what I'm going to tell you about. He said, Marion Roach has just written a book on memoir. And he used the word memoir like an expletive. And I thought, now hold on a second. That's what I do. And I was astonished. And that night I started writing to myself what I call my defense of memoir, or my defense of writing. Because this is what we need to understand, that this is a powerful medium that you shouldn't have to stick up for. You should just, have to, you should just do it with all of your heart. So I call it my five Ginzu knife benefits of writing. Remember the Ginzu knife? That's something that comes on late night television. You can buy one for $9.95, but you can buy 18 of them for $8.95. I never <laughs> understood that. But when my five Ginzu knife benefits of writing are these. If you write, it'll turn you into a Zen master. It will lead you on a thrilling life of crime. You will learn to win every argument. You will become a super athlete. And here is the one you've been waiting for. It will improve your sex life. <laughs> so how in the world does writing in make you a Zen master? Because as Jeff said so perfectly yesterday, writing is all about living in the moment. We have transactions every single day, thousands of them with our people. Our children come to us in moments of wonder. Our spouses come to us in moments of disbelief. Our sister-in-laws say things to us that are so passive aggressive that we simply don't know what to say back. <laughs> oh, did I just go on a little tangent about my sister-in-law? You'll hear more about her later. <laughs> I always look forward to that part of the talk. So the, the lesson comes from the same lesson you get at high-end bingo and high-end auctions and all of those places where you have to be present to win. Because you do in a life of writing. You must be present. You must say to yourself, what remarkable thing just happened here? I'm just buying a pair of shoes for my child to start first grade. But that person who's selling them to me just provided an act of kindness to this mother who is so overwhelmed that this child that I adopted in China is now going to first grade and I love her so much and I want to have this conversation about this child's opportunities and that person let me. 
And you go home, and if you're very lucky, you don't turn the radio on in the car and forget about all that transaction you just had with that person. If you're very lucky, you have a pad on the passenger side, and you write something down. And by the time you get home, you don't know much, but you know that you've got a story. And you're going to work on that story, and you're not going to turn the radio on, and you're not going to forget all about it, because you were just present enough to win. And that's the story you're going to sell to NPR. That's the op-ed you're going to write in the newspaper. That's the piece that you're going to write on your blog that somebody's going to see that's going to get you the book contract. That's the piece, even if it's just, and this is a wonderful thing for your family, it's the piece that's going to let them know how you feel. Because you were present when the thing happened. You were present when the person asked the question. I've written four mass market books to date, and one of them I wrote after spending two years behind the scenes in the world of forensic science. I went to blood spatter analysis school and forensic entomology school and autopsies and crime scenes. And I got to tell you, if I could have one parenting tip for you, it's to go to blood spatter analysis school. <laughs> because when I can now read my daughter cuts herself there. She runs down the hall screaming. I can see where she went. And it's a perfect skill. And it's really helped me a lot. <laughs> but the one thing that happened to me in my, in my two years behind the scenes in the world of that astonishing series of sciences is I went to my first autopsy. I am the most squeamish person I have ever met. I have to lie down to get a blood test. I am not proud of this at all. But I had to go to my first autopsy, and when I walked in, the autopsy room was a distance from here to that chair and to those blocks here. This, line, this wall is lined with those metal drawers, and you know what's in the metal drawers, right? It's a lot of dead people. And on the table right there where the couch is is a man lying on a table who's been dead for 10 days. He has full-blown AIDS, and he's still got the garret around his neck from where he was strangled. And I am more terrified than I have ever been in my life. The smell, the whole thing. And I choose a chair over here, thinking, I can just sit here, right? I don't have to actually get near the body. And the forensic pathologist who's allowed me to be here said to me, come on over here. And so I inched closer. The autopsy took five and a half hours. When he used the head saw to pop the top of the head off, the 17 policemen that were in the room with us for this autopsy all had some place to be. <laughs> they suddenly practically killed each other getting out the door. All these guys that were packing a lot of heat, suddenly when that brain saw came out, were gone. But what happened to me during the process of the autopsy was this. As I walked closer and closer to the body, and I looked into the Y incision, and I saw how the ribs harbored the human heart. I had a near occasion to faith. I understood that there was something much bigger than me in the world, that the way that human heart is protected in the body wiped away all my doubt and allowed me to go home and make some notes. And I wrote an essay called My First Autopsy and sent it to NPR. And when the editor at NPR, it was my first one I ever sent in, he called me up and he said, we never had one by that title. <laughs> so you pay attention and you take notes. Because I was just paying attention for the book. It never occurred to me that I was going to get an NPR essay out of that. And it was my favorite essay I ever wrote. It's just, it was humbling to be in the room with that dead body. So after that, you're going to lead a thrilling life of crime. And how does that happen? Because you're going to steal everything you can from everybody you know. Anytime they say anything witty, anytime they say anything perceptive, anytime they make a comment that you think sounds like a good expression, you get to write it down. You get to think about it. You get to repurpose it. You get to quote them. That's how you steal their stuff. Somebody says something to you that's remarkable. My daughter once told me that she wanted a penis. And she was four when she told me, I'm sorry, she was two when she told me that. And you know what I did, of course, being an overeducated liberal, I said, oh dear, lots of women do. <laughs> 
actually took her home and got out my copy of Our Bodies Ourselves. She was two. I was out of my mind. I finally had the good sense to say to her, why is it that you want a penis, darling? And she said, because the toilet seat is so cold. (laughs) Yeah. So you steal her lines, and I turned that into a column. I turned that into another column that I sold. And you... (laughs) And it was a fun thing to write. In 9-11, that awful day, every writer I knew wanted to do something, say something, because that's what you do. You react. That's what writers do. We see something and we react. That's our job. If you don't like what's going on, not just on the op-ed pages of the New York Times, but if you don't like what's going on in the world and you want to write something about, let's say you don't like what's going on with gender discrimination, Write a novel that explores it. If you don't like what's going on with pay discrimination, write an op-ed that explores it. We react to things, we see art, we feel things changing, we think something's coming. Write about it. So I, in 9-11, had the same response. Oh my goodness. And at this point, I had written a lot for NPR, a lot of essays. And I thought, what can I say? What can I do? And then I remembered my father after he retired. My father had the greatest job in the world. He was the sports editor of the New York Times. It was a fabulous growing up with him and meeting sports writers. But after he retired, he went to work on the 101st floor of the World Trade Center for an organization, a sports organization. And his secretary used to catch him lying on the floor so he'd watch the building sway. And I used to go in there and lie on the floor with him and we'd watch the building sway together. But he was the information officer for the New York State Racing and Wagering Commission, meaning he had to talk about horse tracks and all of this. One day he got a letter from a little girl named Nancy Dawson who lived on Devonia Avenue in the Bronx. And she was inquiring about turtle racing rules. She wanted to know if there were any. And my dear, quite eccentric father wrote her the New York State turtle racing rules. No turtles may streak. Turtles and their owners are to practice smiling all day in front of the mirror. (laughs) Lack of smiling will be a penalty of three marshmallows to be eaten by the owner and trainer. And I don't know what Nancy Dawson did with her copy of that letter that she got. But after 9-11, I sent it to NPR with just a little top and just a little bottom so we could all remember what we'd lost. And think about the joy that building brought so many people, those buildings. And they let me read it as an essay. I stole it from my dad. He would have been so proud. So you steal. That's your life of petty larceny. Steal like crazy. Steal from everybody. Steal from your kids. Steal from your sister. Do everything you can. Write it down. You're going to learn to win every argument. This is my favorite one. This is what I love about writing. So years ago, you probably remember the same thing I do, that we were all very, 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 very proud, sort of suspender snapping proud, that we had mapped the human genome. We understood the genome. We get it. We're great. So I went around and I asked all my friends, so what do you know about the genome? And they'd say, oh, well, you know, after the OJ trial, we all know about, oh, and after mapping it, you know. I said, no, just tell me like four facts. And nobody could. And I thought, well, that's bizarre, because we're supposed to know this stuff now, right? So I thought, what can I do? Because this is the way I am, because I'm just incredibly boneheaded. What can I do to teach America the human genome? And I thought about it, and I thought about it. And I have this collection of recipe card files. Maybe you do, too, from the the women that have come before me who have died. My mothers, my grandmothers, my mother-in-law my husband's sister who died, and then one that my mother-in-law made for my husband when he went off to college. My mother-in-law is probably responsible for killing more people than anyone I know (laughs) by the contents of her recipe file. She's from the Midwest. The contents of every recipe, except for the desserts, and I am not making this up, include spam, rice, fat, and a can of cream of mushroom soup. It is the most repulsive series of recipes you have ever seen. But none of the recipes is more repulsive than her recipe for spam chop suey. 
And I was listening to the radio one morning down in my kitchen, and on the radio was another one of these, whoa, we mapped the gene for rah, 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 and aren't we fabulous? And I'm thinking, oh, stop it. And then I looked at my recipe files, and I looked at the radio, and I thought, ha, 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 ha. no, you can't do that. And I ran upstairs to my office, and I wrote the explanation of DNA based on my mother-in-law's recipe. You're right, you got it, for spam chop suey. <laughs> there are four basic ingredients in the genome, in every gene, A, G, C, T, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. There's four basic ingredients in every one of my mother-in-law's recipes. And I wrote the piece, and I sent it in, and about two days later, I get a call. Hello, Marion. This is, God, I won't tell you his name. I'm the science editor at NPR. <laughs> oh my God, if I'd had a tablecloth to go under, I would have gone under it. It's like, oh no, now they're gonna. He said, I am outraged by what you wrote. But we're gonna run it anyway. <laughs> and he had the, such the grace and lovely temperament to send me back an email after it ran saying we got more mail about that one than anything else. People saying, thank you, I now know there are four basic ingredients in every gene. So I set out and did what I was supposed to do. Number four, you're gonna make, it's going to make you a super athlete if you write, and it is, because Stephen Pressfield says that you've got to play hurt, and you do. And this is the hard one. You've got to play hurt. The great book, the, the war, the, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna tell you Jeff Goins' title because I always do the same thing, I can do it. Stephen Pressfield's great book on writing. He tells you you have to play hurt. So what does that mean? When I was 22 years old, my mother's mind went to battle with something and lost. It was 1981 and I didn't understand what was wrong. My father had just died, she was 49 years old and she was losing her mind in handfuls. By the time she was 51, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And I was, I've got really bad allergies, excuse me. Um, and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I was working at the New York Times as a clerk. I was in my 20s and I went to the magazine editor and I said to the magazine editor, somebody's got to write a piece about this disease. I've never heard of it. There are four and a half million people in the country apparently who have it. He said, I've never heard of it. He called in Larry Altman, the famous science writer, and he said, well, I've heard of it, but nobody's doing any research on it. And it was one of those moments out of a Busby Berkeley musical where they turn to me and they say, why don't you do it? I was a kid. I was living with an Alzheimer's patient. My dad had just died. And that magazine, the most powerful magazine, the most powerful piece of journalism in the world, took a chance on a then 25-year-old. And I wrote a piece that introduced the world to Alzheimer's disease. It went on to be the most reprinted piece in the history of the magazine. And I ended up on the Today Show the next day, testifying before Congress four times and beginning a conversation about Alzheimer's disease based on my mother's loss of her mind. By the time she was 56, she was in a nursing home. By the time she was 64, she was dead. I have probably written a million words on my mother, a book, countless ma magazine articles, countless op-eds, funny essays, sad essays, essays where she's not really the main character, but you have to learn to play hurt because writers react and that's what we do. You react, something happens, you say, what's this about? What's going on here? The last one, to bring you out of your sadness, don't forget, we're now gonna improve your sex life. So here's my cardinal rule. I tell this to all my clients. I tell this to all my students. I teach all over the place. I'm, I'm, uh, I teach worldwide. And I use this line all the time because they want to read their stuff to their families. <laughs> Here it is. Never read your stuff to someone who depends on you for food, sex, or shelter. You're going to get one of two responses. Neat! not going to do you a lot of good as a writer. Or the other one, I don't understand it. That's no good. And that brings me to my sister-in-law. <laughs> my sister-in-law is one of those people who says, would say to her children when they were growing up, I'm sure someone will dance with you at the prom if you wear that dress. 
right? To me, she used to say, oh no, by the way, I'm an author of four books. I've had a, lo a long, good career at the New York Times. I've done NPR essays. I have hundreds of clients worldwide. I've taught more than 2,000 people in classrooms. And she says to me at every holiday, are, are you ever going to get a job? <laughs> I love that. And for years it tortured me and I would do this. And then one day I thought of this line. I have a fully funded curiosity. And that's what writing is. That's what we do for a living. We fund our curiosities. So you're just going to improve your sex life if you don't read it to somebody who, can depend, who depends on you for food, sex, or shelter. But you're also going to remember that you have a fully funded curiosity. So how do you do this? How do you do what Jeff told you I was going to tell you how to do? How do you find out what your story was about? You learn to write with intent. That means if you're 25 years old and you have no idea how to write a New York Times Magazine article, you study the form and you do it. If you want to write for NPR, you study the form and you do it. If you want to write an op-ed, and every single one of you has hundreds of op-eds in you because you have hundreds of areas of expertise within you, not just your professional expertise. Maybe like me, you're the person who takes the dog to the vet when the dog has to be put down because no one else in your family can do it. Maybe you have a child who's adopted from China and you have some issue that you would like to write about, about international adoption, when international adoption or immigration is under attack. Maybe you know something about inoculating children. Maybe you know something about being the only person in your family who can get your mother-in-law to take her medication because everyone in her family is a big blonde football player, but she has MS and you have Crohn's disease. And somehow that has created a wavelength that you can communicate on. You can write from your hundreds of areas of expertise because memoir, at least, is written best from one area of expertise at a time. And so you learn to write with intent. You study the form and you write from one area of your expertise at a time. Studying the form, of course, fits for all writing genres. You want to write a novel? Study novels. Study, study, study. Master the craft. You want to send a piece to Good housekeeping, they have four different columns that you can do that for. You go to the library, you read the last 24 issues of that column, you learn that it's an 800 word column, you look at the guidelines online, and you send them to their guidelines what they want to publish. You learn to write with intent because you want to be heard, and you don't use writing prompts and writing exercises. You do it for real. And that's how you learn to do it. How do you decide what your, what your piece is about, though? How do you get there? What was my book about, my first book, my book on, that, that talked about my mother's Alzheimer's disease? It wasn't about me. It wasn't about her. It was about the heartbreaking lack of care for the, for the alive but incapable person in America. It wasn't about me. Memoir is not about me. It's about something, and I am the illustration of that thing. It is about peace or honor, justice, injustice, the heartbreaking lack of care for the alive but incapable person, and I am the illustration of that. And once you learn that, you can write. How do you find out what the thing is about? You throw out the writing prompts, you throw out the exercises, and you do this. You say to yourself, what is it about? What am I arguing? I'm arguing that a, there's a heartbreaking lack of long-term care in this country at that time. What am I arguing? And I'll give you a little gift for those of you who want to write a better blog post, a better piece of memoir, a better piece about something that you want to be the illustration for. And it's this. And write this one down. It's my little algorithm. It's foolproof. It is about X as illustrated by Y to be told in a Z. It is about X as illustrated by Y to be told in a Z. You can choose any one of those first. Okay, I know I want to write a book. Great, there's your Z. I know that the illustration that I want to use is the bout of cancer that I survived. 
Okay, now we're talking about areas of expertise. Something that I went through. What's it about? Is it about survival? Is it about resilience? Is it about what? It's about X as illustrated by Y to be told in a Z. This algorithm will change your life because you learn to run all your stories through it. And you're always going to get stuck on the what's it about until you get it right. It's about that moment when you first know that you've been seeking approval all your life and you decide to stop. Ooh. Your argument, is it approval? And seeking it can be stopped at any time in your life. It's never too late. It's going to be illustrated by my leaving an abusive relationship. It's going to be illustrated by my making a decision to go back to school for the thing I wanted to learn. That's how you do it, X, Y, and Z. And it works for me. It works every day. So you decide what you're going to write about. You decide how you're going to illustrate it. And you decide what form you're going to use. That's what I wanted to tell that NPR commentator when he spat out that little word memoir that day. And that's what I wanted to tell you today. Thank you so very much and right on. Thanks, Marion. Isn't she great? Marion, I don't think I landed this plane. Uh, you know, some, some thoughts kind of go up there and they never come back down. Marion reached out to me probably five years ago almost uh, and said, hey, I wrote this book on memoirs. This is 2011. Yeah. Um, by the way, you know, I used to work for the New York Times, you know, written four books with major New York publishers. I've uh, been teaching memoir for 15, 21, 21 years. Um, and... Uh, and, you know, uh, I did these spots for NPR. She just read me her byline, and, I, and she's like, can I, like, you know, do you want to read my book and just tell me what you think about it and maybe do an interview or something? And I was like, oh, sure, yeah, that sounds cool. You know, I mean, it was, it was really great. And um, so began a relationship, a writing mentorship, and... Friendship. Um, a friendship. Yeah, hopefully we've been able to help each other. But I just want to read this because I didn't get to do this. Um, but I want to give you some more context for what Marion has done. And what I want to do is I want to apply the XYZ uh, algorithm that she gave us right now and get a little bit of you know, Q&A going because I want to share my mentor with you. Because uh, one of the things that Marion has helped me do is figure out, what am I actually writing? Mm. What do I actually have to say? And, and why does it matter? And the more I write, guys, and the more I speak and try to share words with the world, the more I realize that the first step is to try to have something really interesting to, st to say. <laughs> and, and Thank like, you like, for that. You know? Like, <laughs> And I believe everybody has a story, but yep. not everybody's great at telling their story. And Marion's going to help us do that. So, um, Marion, you've written several books. My favorite is The Memoir Project, which is here. And it's, um, you should go buy it. It's 100 pages of no-nonsense, kick-in-the-butt, Stephen Pressfield-style, go write your story now. I love what you say about writing prompts. You don't need to practice writing. You need to write for real. She said that here. Uh, but, like, my also favorite book is The Roots of Desire. The Myth, Meaning, and Sexual Power of Red Hair. Which is true. <laughs> and a couple other books. She mentioned uh, another name for madness that got her started writing in 1985. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as a young writer. And you were with the New York Times at that time? Uh, writing from a place of frustration. Your mom had this terrible disease that nobody knew much about. You appeared before Congress. Four times. Incredible stuff. The places that writing can take you is really amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to do a little bit of Q&A. What I want you guys to do is I want you to write out that XYZ and um, any kind of questions that you have for Marion, in particular about what you write about, um, I think is, is really helpful. I've got a few questions for her, but I want each of us to apply this right now. And again, the idea here is not that you're like married to this, but write that down. What is that XYZ uh, algorithm one more time? It's about X as illustrated by Y, to be told in a Z. It's Everybody about have X, that down? Yeah. 
So if you've got a big story, you've got, been through something, you've raised a child with special needs, you've buried a husband, you've... Uh, and, and they shouldn't all be sad. There are some joyous, wonderful things to write about, too. People that realize things. Something from your life that you really want to write about. So let's talk about it, and let's get you writing today. So what's something that somebody has? What, what came to mind when she was talking about that? Who's going to be brave? David. Literal, literal sleepwalking? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Great. So a lot of sleepwalking through life, just drifting through life. And uh, recently he's woken up more and is more lucid. He talks about lucidity. Great. Yeah, that's perfect. So here's the deal. So lucidity is probably one of the most sought after concepts and realities in our lives, lucidity, because most of us feel that we're one off or that we're watching ourselves or we're not really fully engaged. And there are whole bookstores filled with books on mindful living. So you've hit on a word that I haven't heard much that's differentiating you in the market. So right there, that's fabulous. So the book is about lucidity. And I expect if I plopped down next to you at a dinner party and you told me that, because I'm a writer, and you said, oh, I have this idea, I would be asking you questions about how you came to that lucidity. And I would be Assuming you know something that I don't, that's your area of expertise. So it's about lucidity as told in a story of my waking up to be written in book length form. And so then we've got three acts. Every, everything has to have three acts. Every piece of nonfiction is an argument. It's about something and every book is three acts. So you got lucidity. So I'm assuming we can take your argument, write it out on a piece of cardboard this is my idea of very high-tech book structuring. I, use a, I have a cardboard right now sitting at home that's outlining my current book. I would take whatever you're going to argue, which is your area of expertise, you write your argument across here, you draw two lines down here, you list your scenes from Act 1 here. At Act 1, that's when the hero really realizes he's in trouble. At the at Act 2 is all about exploring all the easy ways to come to lucidity, and then one day realizing, uh-oh, i got to try the hard stuff. The real crisis comes at the very last at scene of Act 2, and Act 3 is living with the cure. And this is the way you structure a book, three acts, your argument across the top about lucidity. And you know what? This is your new best friend. Because you can stop talking about that book, and I'll go wait for the book at the bookstore right now to read your book on lucidity. Does that help? That would be wonderful because you should. If you've got product, but you have a story, this is perfect. Thank you. Anybody else feeling stuck? Maybe they don't know what they write about or they've got a story to tell and they're not quite sure how to share it? This one over here. Yeah. Hey. Hey. So there's a million, she talked about anonymity, how, whose story is it really, feeling uncomfortable about telling people, telling a story that may not be wholly your own. So it's a great question. Whose story is it really? And what's the truth? Family is a pizza. Everybody gets one slice. The day, uh, my favorite Christmas is a Christmas my sister said never existed. I love that about my sister. She says, that never happened. That's family. <laughs> so every... Right, right. You're, that's a rueful laugh. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, first of all, you don't have to worry about the truth with too much. The tr we're talking in memoir about the truth according to you. In other words, your sister's side of the story, I'm just not concerned about right now. There's a million reasons not to write. The foremost one is what will people think? What will they think? Is this really my story? So I always tell my clients, write the story first, and then let's see what you've got. Because after you start, I guarantee you that your story is going to change, and it's going to become about something that you can write. To the terror of telling other people's tales stops people too often from writing their own. 
after that, there are devices, not just changing names, that's the easy way to do it. There are marvelous devices with which to reposition people, re give them totemic names, give them totemic roles, talk about them in ways that don't reveal who they are. You can work through many devices of writing and solve the problem of worrying about what we people will think. But first and foremost, get a rough first draft. I call it the vomit draft. Get the vomit draft down, and then let's see what you've got, OK? Well, can you elaborate on that a little bit? You said give them totemic roles. Yeah. Great, great word. What is it, what's an example of that? So the procrastinator. So you, instead of calling him dad, let's call him the procrastinator. Instead of calling, think of them as chess pieces. The king, the queen. What metaphor works for your story when you're trying to tell the story of your family? Make them all chess pieces. Make them all people who, who, run a, in, who have roles that we all will recognize, but don't identify specifically to that person. Um, my sister-in-law gets a lot of copies. She still doesn't know I write about her. It's hilarious. <laughs> That's because she sees she doesn't read my stuff. She just wants me to get a job. <laughs> yeah. So um, one of the things that I love that you talk about is, you know, subject versus theme. And we saw this last year at Tribe. I don't know what, um, the, you know, sort of the turnout is here. But who here feels like they have an important personal story to share with the world? Something that happened to you mm -hmm. or that you did or accomplished or overcame? Raise your hand. Yeah. That was, I mean, that was, it's, I don't know, and over you half do. the room. Yeah. And we get that everybody has a personal story, but I remember last year, and even this year, I've heard some folks say, abusive household, or, you know, I overcame this obstacle, or I lost a bunch of weight, or whatever it might be, but you know you have this story. People have told you, you need to write a book about that, yep. but now you don't know what to do with that, and... You speak to that, I think, really well, because it's not just about telling your story. No. It's about finding the theme. Well, memoir is not about what you did. Memoir is about what you did with it. That's a huge difference. That's good. I don't want to hear your diary. Please don't make me read your diary. <laughs> and you don't want me to read your diary either, remember? You used to hide it from your mother. So you don't want me reading your diary. I want to know what you did with it. I want you to show me you experiencing some kind of transcendence, not tell me that you did. One of the places people get into trouble with this a lot is in faith-based memoir, where they say, right about the beginning of Act 3, and then I found God. Could you please share with me that transcendence? Could you please remember to include me in those moments of awareness that God was with you? Could you please remember the reader and not just tell me that I went here, I did this, I did this, I found God, I'm good. That's not being a reliable narrator. A reliable narrator is not just somebody whose story we like. It's a person who knows what truths to tell. When I enter your story, I am entering your country, and I transfer all of my currency for yours, just like when you travel abroad. That currency is the details you choose to tell me, those details should only be in there if they prove your argument. But I expect to cash every one of those coins before I leave your country. In other words, if it's not about your argument, it shouldn't be in the story. Save it for another memoir. This was taught to me by the great Caroline Knapp. She wrote a book called Drinking, a love story. It was a major bestseller. When she went to write her next memoir, she wrote a book called A Pack of Two. It was about her relationship with her dogs. Had she not died tragically at 54 years old, she would have written 10 book-length memoirs, each from one area of her expertise at a time. When she did die, her best friend, Gail Caldwell, wrote a memoir of their friendship called Let's Take the Long Way Home. One area of your expertise at a time, your details are your currency, you must have an argument. You can do this. You all have stories to tell. But it's not about what you did. It's about what you did with it. Love that. Wow. So who here feels like they have a story to tell now and wants to get it out into the world? Wouldn't it be depressing if everybody like, didn't raise their hand? <laughs> I have three resources for you that I would recommend. One is Marion's book, which is here, The Memoir Project. Understand that uh, that book will teach you how to tell your story well, whether or not you think of yourself as a memoirist. I would highly recommend it. I don't, I kind of wrote a memoir once, didn't go that great. 
Uh, but I've been telling stories ever since because of what I learned in that book. Two is you had a, you sent this to me, but I think you've posted recommended books to read. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things I think we struggle with in our culture today with all these blogs and stuff is there's not a lot of, um, there are great writers out there, but the, the most easily accessible writing is not necessarily the best. When I'm trying to become better as a writer, I go to Mary and I go, what book should I read to understand what good writing looks like? She's got a book list on her blog yes. at marianroach.com. Did you recommend A Three Dog Life to me? No. That's a great book. Anyway, that's a good book. Read that book. <laughs> three Dog Life. <laughs> uh, it's about this woman with three dogs. Um, and that's not what it's about. That's the plot. Right. Yeah. Caught you. It's actually about her husband. Did you read it? No. It's about her husband who uh, has this horrible brain injury, and she's got to learn to move on without him. So it's about moving on. Yeah. As it's about told. Moving. Yeah, go ahead. X, Y, Z. It's yeah. about moving on, as illustrated by, see, that's the difference. Yeah. A story of a woman with three dogs. Yeah, there you yeah. go. Uh, and then lastly, you've got a course, a, a new product that you just put out. Are you learning from her? Like, this is why I want her here, because she's incredible. Thank and I would love for you to continue to learn from her. And if you go to marionroach.com, what do they find? They'll find a new five steps to writing great memoir. And some of those are courses. And I hope I'll see you there. Thank you so much. Great. And for Marion Roach Smith, please. Thank you. Thank you.